Hello, good day, everyone. I'm Dave Rubenstein, editor in chief of SD Times. I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's SD Times Live Tech Talk on modernizing your software development lifecycle without compromising customer trust. Many organizations have adopted the move fast and break things motto, racing to put software into the hands of their customers and relying on their feedback to improve the software. But delivering software, of course, as we know, that has problems can uh, you know, erode your customer base and uh, perhaps even destroy your reputation. So to talk about the things that organizations need to do, we've put together a great panel of speakers here today who I'll allow us to introduce themselves and describe their companies and what they do. But before we do that, I have just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, today's panel, of course, is live and we'll be taking questions throughout the presentation. Uh, so if you have a question, just uh, go into your control panel, navigate to the questions tab, type it in, submit it, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, secondly, today's uh, tech talk is being recorded, uh, so you can replay it uh, time and again to your heart's content over and over uh, starting uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so now to get the ball rolling, I'm just going to throw it over to Edith Harbaugh. She's the CEO of Launch Darkly, and we'll get all the introductions going. Thanks. So I'm CEO and co-founder of Launch Darkly. We started seven years ago in 2014. Our mission is to empower all teams to deliver and control better software. And to your earlier point, we think there's been this dichotomy between you can either move fast or you can increase value. We think we can do both. And we've helped large enterprise customers like IBM, Atlassian, Intuit on that journey. Okay, uh, Joe, you, next is, would you like uh, Joe to go Duffy, next? CEO of Pulumi. Excellent. Yeah, my name is uh, Joe Duffy. I'm founder CEO of Pulumi. Uh, founded the company a little over four years ago. Um, Pulumi is a cloud engineering platform, really helping infrastructure teams and developers work together to ship fast with confidence. Uh, so, uh, great topic for today's conversation. Uh, we have a flagship infrastructure as code uh, technology that allows you to use your favorite languages to do infrastructure as code and tap into things like AWS and Kubernetes and um, spin up infrastructure and build great cloud software. And so really excited to be here today. Okay. Awesome. And hey, I'm Jordi. I'm the CEO of Armory. Uh, Armory is a company with a software delivery platform that is powered at the core by Spinnaker. Uh, Spinnaker is an open source project from Netflix and Google and is used by some of the world's largest companies to deliver software with, uh, with safety and velocity. So I'm really excited to talk about that today. Armory has a distribution of Spinnaker that is used by companies like Autodesk. There's actually a great reInvent talk from Autodesk about how we, we in partnership with AWS, helped Autodesk go multi-region global and deliver features globally in minutes instead of months. And it's this kind of real, real business value that excites us. It's why I get up in the morning. I, I really believe that the majority of enterprise value over the coming decades is going to be driven by code. Uh, most global 2000 companies do not yet uh, really know how to uh, power value through code. They are often just assembling off-the-shelf software, uh, you know, stringing SAP uh, installations together. And some of the more progressive global 2000s are really, I think, showing the industry what is possible and how much enterprise value can be unlocked. Just look at the PE ratio of a company like Tesla compared to a traditional auto manufacturer. It's those, those, those types of things that I believe and I imagine that the three of us believe are going to be very transformational over the coming decades. And we do absolutely know that it is possible to have both safety and velocity, but it requires more sophistication. And I'm excited to talk about that on this, uh, on this panel today. Good stuff. So uh, I guess I'll circle back to um, uh, one of the points uh, Edith made early on, and that is, is it even really possible to move fast without breaking things? So uh, Edith, why don't you get that started? Yeah, I'm happy to do so. I think if you move slowly, it's somehow more likely that it'll break something. And let me give you a real example. So if you're doing the old style of software releases of 20 years ago, where you do a release every year, every release has so much heft and weight and gravity behind it. Um, not just in terms of technical complexity about you're checking in all these different branches, you're having all these different features, but even in terms of business risk about what you planned a year ago might not even be relevant. So you saw this trend of like these 
huge releases that would just kind of flop out in the field. And they're extremely expensive because then your cadence is this flopped, there's a ton of bugs, I have to spend a whole year fixing the bugs and trying to squeeze in some actual business value. To Giorgio's point, if you can cut down releases to a point where you can release every day, every week, every month, you can let the business value drive that cadence again. And, and, I, and then each release can have a lot more impact and also a lot easier to control. Like for example, if you put out a release and it's just like, oh gosh, this one is a dud, but I'm releasing tomorrow also and I can just quickly fix this. That is a lot less risky. Um, so I'll, one, I'll... One, of our, one of our customers into it, um, they refer to it as trying to have speed as a habit. You know, of like, hey, if we if we can always quickly react as a habit, it's just much less risky. Let me just add on to what Edith is saying because I, I actually would reframe the question a little bit, David. So here's what we have found from these large but but more progressive global 2000 enterprises. This is all about uh, relative costs and prioritizing relative costs inside of an organization. And I think it actually has a lot to do with psychological safety of the organization, which includes the executives who are afraid to get fired if they release defects in prod, but also that developers are so powerful that with you know one line of code, a developer can break 20 years of brand equity that a business has been building. And so there's this fear that a, a release means nuking the entire user base. And what, what we have found is that with additional sophistication, a company is able to have both safety and velocity, but that additional sophistication requires focus and investment from the enterprise. And it takes the form of, for example, one, one example is canary deployments. So a canary deployment, for those that aren't familiar with it, is an engineering exercise that is, and it's called a canary because of, of, of this idea that a canary in a coal mine falls over first when there's gas. And so it's the kind of early signal that there's a problem. Well, developers just want to get to production. I, I think of, of devs as artists. They have code and they want to get their code out into the world and they, they want to learn from that code and they want to learn as quickly as possible so that they can have an iterative cycle. I don't know that executives often understand there's like nothing more soul sucking for a developer than having code sit on the shelf for a month or a quarter. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it, it makes the best developers not want to work at companies that, that have that lack of sophistication. So in that pursuit of safety, what companies are doing, like Edith is saying, is they're not able to innovate as quickly and learn as quickly, but they are also not able to create an organization that allows this fast feedback loop and fast learning cycle. A canary deployment, allows a company to limit the blast radius of a change. So instead of having a change affect 100% of the user base, you can have it affect 1%. You can pick which 1% that is. Maybe it's the more progressive customers. And so in this way, you, you give the developer what they want, which is the ability to learn quickly. You get the company what it wants, which is really about safety. So what we've learned is you have to have the seatbelt strapped on before you can drive the Ferrari fast. Really, it's about safety and reliability before it can be about velocity. The company has to have the psychological safety to be able to flip that 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 cost benefit analysis in their heads that it is worth deploying out to one percent of the population, so you can deploy out ten or a hundred times faster. Um, and 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 so it's important to calculate the costs of moving slowly and having all these gates between, you know, the dev and Broad and and use that as a, a a factor in the analysis of what does it actually mean to be safe? What are the costs of being slow? And being able to quantify those costs from a business perspective I think is a really important part of this. Great. So that kind of leads me to a question. You, know, you, you bring up the topic of um, canary deployments. And I know uh, Edith launched Arkley, uh, you know, relies on feature flags to uh, you know, segment uh, segment the releases. So, uh, Edith, I don't know. Maybe you could explain what the difference between those two things is. Between uh, or do they actually go hand in hand with each other? They're hand in hand. Uh, I'll say up front, uh, we are a customer of Jordio's company, Armory. So, thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, I think they're part of an overall flow. Uh, what we do is kind of the next step of say you're a huge 
restaurant brand, for example, that has chains all over the United States, Canada, international, and maybe multiple franchises. With LaunchDarkly, you can do a release to different geos, to different brands, to different franchises, and really control that in a really efficient way, which, to be honest, is nothing new to people who've been doing marketing. Like, you always used to do geo marketing in terms of like, hey, we're going to have a different promotion in New York versus LA because of weather differences. Sure. So what we're really doing is just allowing you to do that with software in a way that you can, again, move fast. Like, you don't want to wait for New York to be the same as LA, but to do it in a way that's controlled and efficient. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And I'll just add on to this. Uh, so Edith, you wrote a really, really great post about uh, how Spinnaker and Feature Flags uh, are different and work together. I'm going to try something here. I'm going to try posting this blog post of yours in the chat and hope that everybody can see it. So I just, I just posted that. So anyway, hopefully it'll be accessible. But the way that I think about it is that uh, canaries are an engineering activity typically, and feature flags are often unlocking value up up in the stack, for example, with product managers. Um, engineers should always be able to be releasing on whatever cadence the business needs. And although Netflix re releases thousands of times a day, that's not necessarily the right thing for every company. Again, it's about safety first. But being able to be safer, I think the way Edith said it is so good, right? When, when, when you back up all of these changes and then you cut a huge release, it's very hard to find the problems. You're actually less safe than if you are releasing on a cadence and you can more easily roll those changes back and then I you know identify what the problems were so um, you know I think about canaries engineering activity feature flags product you know etc activity generally as a way to distinguish between the two I think the one other element uh, here that we definitely see because we work with a lot of customers on cloud you know adopting new cloud architectures and and sort of modernizing the, their approach to their applications. I think that that also goes hand in hand here because what we see is, you know, the a lot of these distributed architectures, whether it's microservices or serverless or, you know, adopting Kubernetes, the, the sort of blast radius of any one change becomes a lot smaller. The granularity of rolling things out and rolling things back and testing things out is much smaller. Individuals are more empowered to to make those those finer grain decisions. It's not like you're shipping you know, version 12 of the monolith. It's it's like, it's you're really shipping, you know, our customers are shipping literally multiple times a day. Uh, sometimes just, you know, individual Git commits go straight to production. And like, for some people that sounds terrifying, but once you change this mindset of actually validating changes, you know, more in production and getting getting real usage and having some of the protection of feature flags and and finer granularity and canaries really helps you to to sort of get value out to customers faster but also validate and, and shorten that loop and i think you know that that is a major motivation we see with a lot of folks that are trying to modernize um, their application architectures as well mm -hmm. to, to add on to that i mean what launched darkly my, my company really helps with is separating out deployment which is that a developer does have that power they can check in as often as they want but then giving that safety to the business of it might be checked in, but we are controlling the release. Like it's there, it's available, we can turn it on, we can give it to some customers, and we can also turn it off very quickly if it's just not working. I think the move fast and break things got a bad rap when it's kind of horrifying to think, hey, a developer that I'm not even talking to could suddenly blow up my entire customer base without all these gates. Like uh, like lunch darkly like um, like what we're doing to help with that. One one thing that I would add here is I think what what Armory, Palumi, and Lunch Darkly each do is they enable these enterprises to have more sophistication. The things that we're talking about are all about having more sophistication, and that sophistication leads to not having to make that false choice between safety and velocity and we we often think about it as guardrails where we meet the customer where they are and then we help them get to where we know that they can be and they often have some idea of where they want to be but there's not like there's a playbook that's written for digital transformation 
Uh, I mean, lots of lots of companies are figuring this out in real time, especially with the advent of of cloud. And so, these are all ways to be more sophisticated. To like Edith is saying, to allow the business to have control over when features are actually experienced by the user, and to divorce that process from the actual software delivery process and giving the engineering teams control over the blast radius. And you know, all this is about introducing psychological safety inside these companies. It's a terrifying idea to be bringing making customer trust continuously for most companies. It's the last thing that they want to do. So a lot of this is about meeting the customers where they are and then allowing them to progress. And I think things like deployment windows are a great example of that. We had a large customer that was um, mandating deployment windows, which Spinnaker allows. It Spinnaker allows you to do that in very sophisticated ways. And then as the customer started breaking models into microservices, they didn't have enough time in those windows to actually deploy everything. And the VP was insisting on signing off on, on everything, which Spinnaker allows. You can have a manual judgment made the VP feel safe. But then as they were able to get more sophisticated with some of these other things, blue greens and canaries and one-click rollbacks, et cetera, they can start to take those other gates out because they realize that they are just stifling innovation and not providing as much value. Good. Yeah, I, I know we were talking a little bit before, uh, before we went live uh, about uh, 2021 and now organizations starting to return to work, you know, physically or people going back into the office. What are you guys seeing in terms of what impact that's going to have on the the uh, you know all the things we did in 2020 to accommodate people not being in the office and now you know people are coming back to the office in many cases. So I just kind of want to get your views on where you see that uh, happening uh, for the rest of the year and into next year. We could probably just spend the whole time talking about this. I mean, this is so top of mind for the three of us. We we're just talking about it before right. the panel started. Right. Uh, I don't know, Joe. You you had a really interesting perspective. Maybe you should start this one. Well, I, I think you know one of the there. I think there are a lot of good things. I mean, there are a lot of bad things, obviously. But like it, from a like we became much more reliant on software and remote pro practices, and a lot of that actually goes hand in hand with what we're talking about because this. This idea of shipping often and shipping continuously, like you're relying, you're not in a, you're not, you're not in an office like orchestrating the schedule on a whiteboard and manually talking to your manager to say, okay, are we okay to release this thing? Like you're actually relying on a lot more of the automation. And so I actually saw within our own customers, it really accelerated folks moving in the direction of shipping more continuously and thinking differently, thinking in a, a whole different way about how the team works together and collaborates through software platforms like Arm Armory and you know LaunchDarkly and Pulumi and lots of others you know collaboration tools like GitLab and I think all of that led to a lot of positivity and and honestly I, what I hope is that this return to the office doesn't undo a lot of that progress right I think it, it it allows us to go back to sort of the old way of doing things and I know for my company for Pulumi like I actually think the culture improved in many ways because the communication you know. Um, became more, you know, digital, let's say. So there's a lot more artifacts of like, why did we ship this thing? Why did, you know, why did we turn this feature on? And I think so a lot of that is positive, but you know, there is the risk that we just resort, revert back to the old way of doing things. Um, it's more comfortable and, and, you know, shipping slower is in some ways sort of a safety uh, net for folks, so. Yeah, I kind of think that, uh, you know, for our company, we, we went fully remote and i think you tend to emphasize communication more you're more conscious of the fact that oh i haven't spoken to this person in a while let me make sure you know touch base how are projects going what's happening what's going on when you're sitting in an office even though you're just a room away you may not consciously because you think i can talk to them anytime often you just don't talk to them at all uh so i think uh i think that that's kind of kind of been interesting so uh kind of along the same lines how have you seen the market landscape change because of the pandemic and widespread remote work and uh and uh, all of that so i'll throw it out there to someone I, I think among our own customers last summer everybody was trying to figure out what was going on for lack of a better word mm -hmm. uh they're like i'm not sure if i can continue to invest in digital transformation i'm just trying to figure out my core business and what has come back so much right now is digital transformation is more important than ever. And I need to invest in this. Like I cannot rely on, we have a lot of financial customers uh, 
I can't rely on people being able to go to a bank and talk to a teller. Right. What was kind of a side initiative of, hey, everything really needs to be online or mobile is suddenly front and center. Uh, same with, we have a fair amount of restaurant brands. Uh, you know, if Starbucks is getting a certain percentage of their business from mobile orders, I can't just have a static website. I need to have an, app, an actual application where people can order online, get promotions for them, be pinpointed. Mm -hmm. you know, like basically, um, businesses now are worried they will be left behind if they're not innovating. Mm -hmm. There there was this great meme that was, uh, I don't know if all of you saw it, but it was like, what what has driven your digital transformation strategy the most? And it was like four checkbox options. And it was like CEO, CIO, CTO, COVID-19. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and and like you're saying, Edith, we, we have seen the same thing that when the pandemic started, it was very, very uncertain what the landscape would look like. I mean, I remember talking to a bank, it was, this would have been last March, so at the very front end of it. And they said, you know, we're, we're worried about countries defaulting, like we're, we're not doing anything right now. And then fast forward just a couple of months, and we're finding that companies are just investing in digital transformation um, in, it, at much deeper levels than they were before. And it's because of, you know, of the urgency that, that they're feeling to provide these digital experiences to users. And JP Morgan Chase is a company that awarded us a Paul of Innovation Award, but it was really because CICD is such a big part of their strategy. And they talked about that being a strategy that's coming you know, directly from the executive suite. It's just amazing to see these companies just leaning in so much on, on that, the, the, the importance of being able to have a much more sophisticated SDLC. Um, we've got a customer, it's a gaming company down in LA, that um, you know they they don't write all of their software. They have gaming studios that write software, and for them, being able to control the software delivery assembly line effectively and ensure quality in that SDLC process, even when they're not the ones writing the code, because they're the ones responsible for the code after it's written. It's a really, really, really good use case for Armory because they're not just at the hands of a developer that's offshore deciding how the code gets to prod. They can mandate what that golden path looks like. Well, with COVID and this large digital transformation causing developers to work remotely much more, there are many, 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 many more companies that are trying to figure that same thing out because they're not in the same room anymore. And so again, like we, I, I just, I'm gonna keep hammering on this point. It's about sophistication that enables reliability that then enables velocity. And without making investments in that sophistication, you're gonna be stuck with you know, what you've always done. It's like every company can deploy somehow today, those that are, many of them built these very brittle, you know, it's like spit polish and tape, these very brittle scripted paths to production into data centers. The engineers that built those often have left the company. Nobody knows how, how they work. It's like Bob's the only one that can deploy. Bob's on vacation, so we're not going to deploy for two weeks. I mean, we're afraid to touch it. And if you're if you're living with that kind of a very creaky infrastructure that's not cloud native, and then you're looking at these new targets that are popping up, AWS and GCP and Azure and VMware, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And AWS isn't just AWS, it's EC2 and ECS and EKS and Fargate and Lambda, whatever they announced at reInvent. I mean, the fragmentation of the infrastructure layer is just beginning. We're just on the front end of that. So already you've got this real process to deploy into data centers, but that is already not cloud native. And you're starting to you know, have teams that are like, well, I want to I want to be able to deploy into the GDPR compliant cloud or the uh, the cheapest cloud or the fastest cloud or the AI powered cloud. Like, you know, how are you going to make the investments that are going to enable you to have a really good structural foundation to get that sophistication? That is, I think, the main thing that we see these companies wrestling with right now. Yeah, I think I, a lot of that resonates with me as well. I, I would say I sort of like break break what we saw our, in our own customer base into four categories. One is the folks who are fortunate enough to be born in a modern cloud world where they're using public cloud, they're, of course, they're doing CICD, of course, like they wouldn't think to do it otherwise. Of course, they're shipping daily, right? And, and those folks just thrived. And like Snowflake is a customer of ours, and I would hold them up as an example. You know, companies that are recent enough that they were born in the cloud, that's sort of the first category. Second category is folks that already had digital transformation projects underway and were perhaps very far along with those and successful. And I think COVID just accelerated those. Um, uh, I think the third are the folks who were caught flat footed and had to reinvent themselves and reimagine in many cases, their entire business, not just their approach to software, but you know, 
folks that were not, you know, in the healthcare industry or wellness industry, you know, like they had to move online, right? So like Mind Body Online is one of our customers and, you know, their own customers were impacted, but you see a lot of transformation and, and they made it, right? They, they were able to transform themselves largely because of software and because of this modern approach. And then unfortunately there's the fourth category, which is the folks who were not able to adapt or, and, and didn't, didn't survive. Um, but no, no doubt that the common trend is, is moving in the direction of everything we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would just circle back to uh, a, a point that uh, Edith made about um, smaller uh, companies, restaurants and things like that, where for, for a while now, they've been hearing the message, you have to go digital or you're not gonna survive. And it seemed kind of esoteric to them. I run a restaurant, what do I need to be digital for? But then all of a sudden, when you can't have people come into the building, now you need a system that can accept payments. You need to have order online capabilities and all these things that didn't exist before. So I think the digital transformation for a lot of companies that weren't the big ones already doing it, they're like, whoa, this is real now. You know, I, I see that I'm losing business because I can't take an order online or uh, deliver it to someone's home or something like that. So, so what I wanted to ask, kind of piggybacking on that, is that do the companies that are already kind of in a transformation have an advantage uh, because they've already kind of broken through the entry barrier or what have you? Or is it newcomers that would have an advantage because they are lean and they don't have a lot of, uh, you know, technical debt and legacy system, legacy systems and things like that? So uh, I'll just throw that out there. Edith, you're smiling. You want to start it off? I was, I was smiling because that's our entire customer base. I love them both. <laughs> you know, we have huge huge um huge companies that are trying to modernize right and you know they have their brand they have their customer loyalty but they're looking for tools that will make them more modern you know um i'll, I'll call out ibm which is a hundred year old plus company which now brags about deploying multiple times a day that's incredible so i wouldn't call ibm left flat footed i'd say that they're innovating like crazy and continuing to run fast uh, we also have startups like uh, Fubu.tv um, was a startup that I, I started working with us about five years ago, and now they're a public company. Uh, so we love them both. We help them both. Uh, I, I think they can both continue to innovate with the right tools. I always love to show instead of tell, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep dropping links in the chat here in the hope that people people can can see them, but. We have a stages of software delivery transformation maturity model. And so let me let me drop that in here. So hopefully people can see it, but it's basically these five stages that we watch companies go through. Um, we recently have updated that with much more granularity on the different personas and companies. And we haven't published that yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and drop a screenshot of it in. Hopefully my marketing team isn't gonna kill me afterwards, but let me just drop in this version 2.0 as well. So here is the 2.0. And that is, it's it's really interesting to look at that newer one because what we've done is we've really looked at companies that are going from manual to semi-automated to fully automated deployments. And it's interesting to see how the personas change. So it starts out, you can see in the bottom right, the champions are very, uh, very ops heavy. That's, that's all the purple and it moves into SREs on the right side as companies get more sophisticated. Now, what's really interesting to me is that much of the Global 2000 isn't even yet on this chart. Many of them, like I said earlier, the CIOs and CTOs of companies have, have not yet made the decision that it's important for them to be building, you know, to be creating complex user experiences by building their own software. And so really we're only in the first inning of this baseball game. This is still, still very, very early. And I think oftentimes companies feel like they are just already left behind. I think there's still you know, time to create a strategy and to execute against that strategy. But I do believe that in three years, in five years, there is going to be a huge delta in the kinds of enterprise value that is being unlocked by the companies that are making those choices today. So I'd say the biggest problem that we see is companies that say, well, we know we need to do this, but we're gonna do it next quarter instead of last quarter, because we have this janky thing that we've built and we've invested so much money in it, and it's the sunk cost fallacy. They put so much money into what they've already built themselves for data centers that they're not yet ready to, to make that investment and become more sophisticated to lay the foundation for being able to do all the things that we're saying on, on this call. And if, if, if you are watching this and this describes your org, 
you know, you, you are not alone. That's the first thing. There are many other companies in this situation, but it is really, really important to create and execute on that strategy yesterday versus tomorrow or else that delta is going to keep growing. Yeah, I think, interestingly, um, so I actually have this book here, which uh, is the, uh, I'm, this is not a commercial, I'm not getting paid for this, but this is, uh, the CEO of Twilio wrote this book, I really love it, and we're doing a team read of it, you know, the whole company, we have this book club thing, and he kind of makes this point in there that really resonated with me, which is, you know, the commonality between who is doing well in this new environment is people with a software mindset. And that, that's a hard thing to transplant, right? That, that's a cult, deep cultural thing of, do you believe in the power of software for your business? And do you believe in, in that being central to the future of your business? And I think that's, that's kind of, you know, it can be IBM, it can be, uh, you know, DoorDash, or, and, you know, it, it can be any company, really. I don't think it, it breaks down along, you know, Fortune 50, Fortune 500 lines. It, it really is a mindset. And one thing that we see is actually increasingly the CEO who knows that I need to really accelerate my digital transformation. One of the first steps that is a telltale sign that they're committed to it is they'll hire a great software engineering leader and put them in charge of, of the cloud efforts and the CICD efforts and the, you know, the, the uh, cloud transformation efforts. Increasingly infrastructure, what we see is we sort of sit right at the intersection between infrastructure teams and developers and try to help them work better together. Our customers actually ship infrastructure changes continuously, often using things like Spinnaker. Um, and, and all, but increasingly you see a software person running the infrastructure organization, not, not thinking of it as a cost center, not thinking of it as the sort of the old school IT model, but instead that software is really central to everything the company is doing. And that's, that's an exciting trend that I do think the last year also has accelerated. Yeah, we were, Joe and I were chatting before the panel started and we have this shared customer. We'll just leave it at a Fortune 50 technology company for now. But it's what's really exciting to me about Pulumi is as these companies go cloud native and as they start to have all this uh, fragmentation of infrastructure, the ability to provision infrastructure as a part of the software delivery process creates a lot more sophistication. Again, this all comes back to that investment in sophistication, which is what I hear you talking about, Joe, and being able to tie all these things together in the way that the business delivers value to users, which is when the user's experience changes. Like it doesn't matter how much work all of us do, all, all our customers do on the left side of the SDLC if nothing ever leaves the building, right? The power is when the user's experience changes and the ability of the company to do that with safety and then velocity so that you don't end up thinning up the mess on the right side, right? A lot of the tooling on the right side is really about cleaning up the mess. It's like build quality into the software delivery process. Be sophisticated about your ability to deliver software so that you don't need to be dealing with a lot of fires later. Yeah, and I think oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to build on that, that point, like the, the, this notion of the infrastructure being fragmented and, and complicated, needing to be part of this. And even with, you know, frankly, it, it maybe sounds bizarre that you might think of feature flagging some infrastructure changes, but we actually see our customers doing that all the time because the the the, the distinction between what's infrastructure and what's application actually becomes a fair bit blurry with these new modern architectures. We have a customer who, they're, they when the pandemic hit, they had to scale up their application worldwide to a new level of scale that they never experienced before. Um, and they're a content delivery provider. They found that, you know, they had to, they had to scale up in, in India and in China, uh, you know, basically worldwide, and they'd never really done that before. Um, and so being able to have a repeatable process where they could scale that using, uh, you know, software delivery uh, lifecycle applied to their infrastructure in addition to application code was really, really essential to them. I was just going to double back to metaphor that you were using, Jordy, around inventory. You know, if you have a lot of code, yeah, yeah, if you have a lot of code that you have developed, and to your example that you have an engineer who's like, well, I spent three weeks on this or three months or three years on this, and it's not out in the world, that's inventory. And that is actually this exactly. huge risk. Like it's getting staler and staler every moment that it is now out in the world. Like it has dependencies that you don't know about. It's introducing risk because there's new features being added. So the, the idea that by moving fast, you're breaking things. I'd say by moving slowly, you're also introducing risk. 
you're introducing spoilage. It's like, it's not even shelf stable inventory. It's not like it's a can of spam, right? It's more like, it's a very ephemeral thing where that, you know, that, that is not shelf stable and it's going to go bad and it goes bad. Like the second it's left the, the, the keyboard of the developer that wrote it. Right. So yeah, it's like, maybe that's actually, Edith, I think a really great way to contextualize it. When I was saying to David, like it's, it's maybe I would reframe the question. So it's not just about moving fast and breaking things. Agree. Like every company has their, their different bars that they need to not, to not be breaking customer trust at, but everything does come at a cost. And so it's like, do you want to have spoilage of the inventory that's on your shelf and suffer like such spoilage that it kills your entire company? Like that's, that's not great either. So become more sophisticated so that you don't have to have either of those problems. Yeah, like that's, that's, I've, that's what the video is. I've heard horror stories about, we had this long lived branch that we can no longer check in. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Joe, to your point earlier about the, the increasing sophistication, I'm, I'm, I'm the only one that's putting links in here. So, so I'm feeling, I'm starting to feel kind of bad about it, but I would encourage you to put links in too. So it's not just me, but um, there's, there's a really great Globo story about how Globo was needing to become more sophisticated. Um, so Globo is a DoorDash like company, you know, in many parts of the world, Latin America, Asia, Europe, et cetera. And I'll just put that in because it was exactly the things that you're talking about, Joe. It was this need to become more sophisticated and they were doing everything manually before and they just couldn't keep doing everything manually. And the reason that I love Glovo is a story that they told me, which was there are shop owners in Spain, like restaurant owners in Spain that would have had to close during the pandemic. But because Glovo was able to give them a way to reach their customers during the pandemic, they were able to thrive. And it's so fulfilling for me to be unlocking innovation for our customers so that they can be enabling things like that to happen like that. I think a lot of times we get stuck in the technology, but like it's the actual human stories of like business value that we are unlocking for these other companies that is so rewarding to me. Interesting. So yeah, talking a lot about uh, cloud native and all the moving parts, uh, containers, Kubernetes, you know, service meshes, all this, along with the sophistication of the software itself. Uh, now you're tying in issues of security and privacy and all these other things. So so how are organizations now viewing how they have to create their products to make sure that they're touching all those bases making sure that they have security that they're not violating somebody's privacy and so there are kind of i guess these are the the modern day things that go into creating software more than just writing code and testing it and making sure it works so how are organizations dealing with that today yeah i think for me like uh security is maybe the one really important counter example to where you don't want to be testing in production <laughs> like you actually want to get security right uh, from the outset sort of by design by construction right and so i think the thing this is where the guardrails really become important and really having um you know checks and balances in place to to know as you're empowering your team and for us is really essential right because oftentimes we'll work with infrastructure teams who know they've become the bottleneck and they do not want to be the bottleneck um, they don't want to get blamed. They don't want to be the, the, the ones to have to do everything. Like that's actually a common fallacy. People think the infrastructure team wants to be, you know, on the critical path for everything. That's absolutely not the case. They want to empower developers, but it's often security and things like cost management and other, other guardrails you can consider that, that is the thing preventing them from doing that. And so there are a lot of practices, but, you know, things like, you know, Spinnaker with, with stages and pipelines, you know, making sure the right validation happens at the right time that the the right people have visibility into the changes that are going in. So whether that's code review processes or manual human approval processes, um, I think that's really critical to build that into your delivery pipeline so that you're catching things before they get out into production. And we increasingly see that, you know, the security team as well is taking more of a software engineering mindset as well. It's not just the infrastructure team and the developers, but really looking to use the power of software to catch a lot of these mistakes, you know, whether it's through things like sneak, or, uh, you know, with container scanning or, you know, infrastructure as code, where we have a policy as code offering, where you can effectively do static analysis against all of your changes before they ever shift to production and catch common configuration mistakes. There's compliance as well that needs to be, you know, factored into that whole pipeline. And, you know, so it's, it's definitely a complicated area. Um, I wouldn't say you, you, you don't just sprinkle the magic, you know, security pixie dust and everything is good. 
Uh, it takes a lot of work, um, but you know that 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 is an essential part of putting together this uh, you know shipping fast and and being confident. Where could people get that pixie oh, dust? Because <laughs> I think that would be a big help. But uh, Joe, do you have a pixie dust link that you can drop in? Yeah. Direct, direct pixie dust order yeah. link. <laughs> we have some pixie dust. It is not complete pixie dust, but uh, yes, yeah. I can share some some links there. But I, I think oh. you know, sneak like the problem with security is, is um, there's so many attack vectors in the modern cloud architecture. Like the security perimeter for the modern cloud architectures has moved from the data center, where you could literally have like armed guards making sure nobody breaks into your data center. <laughs> So now it's entirely online, right? It's it's interesting when you go through all these, you know, compliance like soft two compliance. They ask you, you know, do you have a firewall? Like, what do you mean? Do I have a firewall? Like everything's in AWS and Git, GitHub, and like you know, it's all distributed, right? And so the attack vector is is much broader, um, and so you sort of have to design for you know principle of least privilege, right? You really have to build it into the architecture of your applications that your applications function in a low trust environment uh, to begin with. I'll, I'll add on to that a little bit uh, because this is just exactly what we what we do, what, what Armory enables. And I actually have a bit of a hypothesis about this. So when you look across the SDLC, there are a number of systems of record across the SDLC. And when I talk to executives at Global 2000 companies, they often do not have a really great understanding of their own SDLCs. At least there's not you know, one team or one person that does. It's across many teams inside the company. I mean, it's kind of mind blowing. It's like there's raw material going in one side of the factory, which are ideas. There's finished product coming out the other, which are features. And it's a black box. And the company does not understand everything that's happening inside. And when you don't understand what the problems are, it's very hard to you know, unblock the blockages. And so a lot of this is about having visibility and an understanding about what's happening and then being able to, to unlock the siloed data across these different systems of record in the SDLC. And I actually, I believe that people often say CI, CD like it's one thing because delivery has never been its own category. And the reason delivery has never been its own category is because companies have been delivering into data centers and every data center is different. So every company had to build their own Rube Goldberg machine in order to deliver code. But now with the cloud, AWS works the same way for you as it does for me. There can now be a platform or platforms where there could be none before. And so I segment delivery out as a separate distinct category from CI, which is everything on the left side of the SDLC before any, any value leaves the building. Delivery is when value actually leaves the building. I don't even call it continuous delivery because like we've been talking about, you have to have safety before you have a velocity. So really it's about reliable delivery at scale, which leads to continuous. Um, and so these are distinct systems of record with distinct teams and personas that all have to assemble together to get software out the door. And a lot of this is about unlocking that siloed data. And so Joe, like you're saying, what we've done at Armory is we've taken OPA, the Open Policy Agent, which is a CNCF project, and we've built that into Armory as a policy as code offering, which is a similar title, but different than what you're talking about, Joe. For us, it's giving these central automation teams the ability to create HOV lanes for devs. So if you have a pipeline developer and you don't take a stage out of that pipeline, you can go right to production. It's an HOV lane, you can move fast. But if you change that pipeline, it's gonna fall out of certification and then you have to come talk to us. And so again, it's about additional sophistication, right? This ability to give dev and ops both what they need in a way that gives them the ability to align interests and have them sit on the same side of the table instead of opposing sides. Yeah. I, I loved your metaphor. Uh, I think the words, so by the way, I love Jez, Humble, and continuous delivery, but I think the words continuous delivery can be terrifying to business users because they look at it like totally. a state. They look at it like, like a drip, 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 drip features. Are like, no, actually what I want to do is have like a set of features all together, which is what a lot of what we do is, yes, you're delivering all the time. You are releasing as a batch and that's you so have, awesome and you have control over that of like here comes yeah. like, an idea goes into the factory it's ready to go but we're going to bundle it nicely and then release it as instead of just yeah. it, it being oh, this is leaking this is so much fun like i'm i'm getting a lot of new tools and ways to describe um you know what we see from our customers with the insights that the two of you are giving me because you're absolutely right 
And this is all about, again, psychological safety inside the organizations. Like it's terrifying to be continuously breaking trust to customers. That's the last thing that any executive wants to do. They're gonna get fired if they do that. And so it's about you know, getting control, but at, not at the cost of stifling innovation and having all that spoilage on the shelf. Yeah, I think also to that point, the, the psychological safety, one, one failure mode I've seen with companies, you know, we've worked with companies that have experienced significant security incidents, and that is a tough thing to recover from because that sort of damages the psychological safety of the organization if, you, if it's not treated correctly, right? You, and this is where things like blameless postmortems and, you know, make sure that, you know, hey, if, some, if somebody were, you know, introduces a security problem, it is not the individual's fault. It is the fault of the the, the, the system around them that permitted that to take place in the first place, right? The, the, the idea is that all of this automation we're talking about should be sufficiently good and airtight that it, it fosters this, this notion of psychological safety. And, and, and if it doesn't, hey, we learn from it and we make sure it doesn't happen again. But what you don't do, the failure mode is to say, because we're terrified about shipping security mistakes. Now we're going to revert back to this monolithic and slow moving uh, release process. I do see that that's the tendency, right? The CIO who gets slapped on the wrist or maybe fired and, and a new CIO comes in to replace the person because, you know, every one of these tends to have a scapegoat despite the blameless uh, desire. Um, it, it, it is a tough situation to deal with. And a lot of major corporations are experiencing these because the cloud is this fast moving multifaceted thing and it the, as i mentioned before the attack surface area is just huge no one person can keep it in their head and so the process the automation is really essential to to having that level of confidence yeah and, and and it's very understandable by the way right it's very understandable when there's a traffic accident and it's like a multi car pile up you know fatal accident on you know i10 or whatever it's very understandable that 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 the company is like oh my god that can never happen again but when it's a, a fender bender, when you can reduce the cost of failure so that it doesn't become these you know, fatal multi-car pileups, then you can improve experimentation. And, I, and like the, I think the thing that we see is executives often think that it's a very binary thing. It's like a one or a zero. It's either, you know, we're gonna, we're, we can only have perfection in production. And, and we think of it more as a spectrum and every company falls at a different part of that spectrum. But the ability to reduce the cost of failure, because the reality is, is that things are changing very quickly and we're, it's, it's not going to be perfection all of the time so acknowledging that is a reality and then saying we're on that scale do we want to fall because there's costs on both side of of the scale there's that spoilage issue on the far other side so where do we want to fall and then how can we provide more tools and more sophistication to these leaders so that their only option isn't to revert back to you know take 10 steps back when there is a problem and this is why that's i think joe you're helping me understand this is why i believe that that sophistication is so important because it provides a richer tool set that companies can use to make choices that will help move them forward instead of just reverting them back. It, it, and I'll add that those not just those big releases are so risky. Yeah, that's like the irony of the whole thing, right? You're like setting yourself up for another multi-car pileup. That's the irony. And it's like, we actually see the switch flip in these executives as they start to have that psychological safety and the safety net of, you know, blue-green deployments or canaries or one-click rollbacks or deployment windows. And they're like, oh, wow, okay, we can move a little bit faster here. And it's like, yeah, and you're actually going to be safer. You just have to kind of get to the other side of that mental model. Yeah, I called those big releases. So I used to do them, you know, we would, I used to call them the push and pray release. Mm -hmm. Yep. Some companies don't do them on Fridays. Others only do them on Friday night so they can clean up the mess over the weekend. Right? I mean, there's all these like machinations that companies do to try to account for the inevitable issues that are going to happen. But if, if you have smaller and smaller chunks of value, it's, it's just much more manageable. Absolutely. Okay. So it looks like we're coming up on the hour. So oh, man, we're, uh, we're just we getting about, started. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. What, I, what I'd like to do is just kind of throw it out to you guys now, uh, just to uh, perhaps give some final thoughts to our attendees and what their takeaway should be based on each of your particular perspectives and the part of the life cycle that you, that you uh, deal with. Uh, and maybe uh, we'll start again. We'll go Edith, Joe, Drodio, and, uh, and we'll wrap it up. Sure. 
I mean, software is made to provide value to customers. So anything a corporation or company or team can do to go from idea to value as quickly as possible while reducing risk is good. And I think there's been this dichotomy that I think we all hashed a lot of, well, you can either move fast or you can deliver value. And my point is that if you're delivering faster, you're delivering more value. Yeah, I, I don't think I can say anything that, that tops that. Uh, so I'll try to add value beyond what Edith, Edith just said, but big plus one to that, um, absolutely. I, you know, I think one of the exciting things that is true today that wasn't even true two or three years ago is you know, really all businesses, really software plays a critical role in those, those businesses. The most innovative companies are the ones who have figured out how to harness the power of software to transform themselves and deliver better customer experiences. So everything we're talking about is about how to deliver better experiences to your customers, and and you know so so I think that that mindset is a software mindset. I think it's it's a very important change that is happening culturally. And I think you know not only is all are all businesses uh, becoming software businesses, but but really the cloud is transforming all aspects of the software development lifecycle. Um, and I think, you know, embracing that change and, and embracing a little bit of the chaos, even if it feels uncomfortable for folks like me who, who've, who've seen the, the old way of doing things and have had to retrain, I, I think, you know, really helps to, to deliver better experiences for your own customers. And, and, and I think is, is an exciting trend that is only just beginning. I think Jordi said we're, we're like in the first inning, and I totally agree, um, but it's starting to accelerate. And so now's the time to, to really lean into those trends and, and start shipping faster with confidence. Okay, so let, let me see if I can if I can bring us home here. So to build on what the two of you have said, I um, you know, I am personally very passionate about unlocking business value for our customers. It is so, so satisfying to be helping Autodesk make features available globally in minutes instead of months, for example, and to help them build a more successful, more scalable, better, and and more richly valued business is just, it is the joy of, of why we started Armory in my garage uh, years ago. So, um, you know, I am uh, very, very happy to talk to any of you who are watching this and to, you know, to better understand your situation. And I, I, I would imagine it's the same for Edith and Joe. We, we, we exist to help you solve problems in your company. And what, what I find is there's just such a sunk cost fallacy thinking in so many companies that we go into where they've invested so much in this old non-cloud native way of doing things. And they have so much of, of their ab ability to innovate tied as a dependency to that previous investment they've made. It is a daunting task to think about how to move from where a company is today to where a company that's on the right side of that maturity model is. But I will say I'm very sure that that is what's going to be the biggest driver of enterprise value over the coming decades. And it's already starting to happen. Half the S&P 500 is going to drop off over the next 10 years. So you know there are companies that are going to thrive. And there are companies that may not die, but they may just be surviving if they don't make these investments today. And the three of us have in our heads so much knowledge about what we see from our customers. And you know, there are just things that you may not know that you don't know yet. And we are, at least I am, I won't speak for the two of you specifically here, but I am so happy to just walk that path and that journey with you and understand where what's blocking you. And I might in, tell you to go talk to Joe or go talk to Edith because of what I am seeing, you know, what I want is I want to help unlock your velocity and ability to innovate and do amazing things with software and code like you were saying, Edith. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put my personal email address into the chat here. And if anybody wants to ping me directly, I'm so happy to have a conversation with them about this. That's great. Uh, so I would like uh, right now at this time to thank Edith Harbaugh, CEO of LaunchDarkly, Joe Duffy, CEO of Palumi, Drodio, founder and CEO of Armory, which is sponsoring today's event. We thank you for that. I uh, certainly would like to thank all the people uh, listening to this, and thanks for spending your time with us. And uh, until next time, I'm Dave Rubenstein, Editor-in-Chief of SD Times. So long for now. And, and maybe we'll get to do the next one in person. We'll see. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> Thank you, David. Take Thank care. You. Good to see you. Good to see you, Jeff. Nice.